architecture. Even this little garden, we'll see that again. It's called, because I know you like Latin, the Hortus Conclusus, the enclosed garden. And that was yet another symbol of Mary's purity. She's sort of locked up and contained, if you like. Um, so when you see a little flowery meadow with a nice picket fence around it, that's referring to her. So anyway, that's about 10 years after. And one of the things, again, just to point out briefly, was that in the North, they're not that bothered with science, as a, you know, as it applied to our things like scientific perspective, uh, which again is being developed about the same time that Compa and Van Eyck are working. But this, in fact, is, I mean, if you, you know all your orthogonals, you take that line there, and it right, ends up at the window. And in fact, I think it's slightly cut off, that would go that way as well. So he's aware of perspective to create that illusion of three-dimensional space on a flat two-dimensional surface. But he's, he's leading your eye up to the window, because even that, and we'll come back to the symbolism of glass later. Um, the fellow who ran the monastery, he, a lot of his writings, he ended up as a saint. A lot of his writings are what he says, you know, you have to lock the, basically lock up your soul to keep the devil out. And the bars on the window, essentially, are a kind of parallel to that. Anyway, that's what they're doing down in Italy, rather different. Now, up here, difficult to know exactly where to start, because there's so much good thing going on just in this central panel. First of all, I guess you could say, really high viewpoint. Because if, if our eye level was down sort of at the level of the table, things would get in the way of other things. So you just zip up in the air a little bit. We'll, we'll see that an awful lot. There's no real business. I mean, look at this bench here. The whoosh back. I mean, that's not, not naturalistic uh, at all. But again, it just sort of sets the space. Level. I think there's a better one that I might be showing you later. There's a clever kind of bench that actually you could... You flipped over the back there, so either you could be using the bench to sit facing the fire and warm yourself that way, or you flip it that way and then you're sitting facing into the living room, basically. So quite a functional piece of furniture, but if you remember last time, wherever it was, it was back there, um, remember I said in this nice domestic interior, you chuck a couple of lions in on the bench and you promote that bench to being the throne of Solomon. We're talking about what Solomon as wisdom personified. So now the bench is more than just a bench. Uh, it's an appropriate setting for her. Uh, there's a, yet another cushion that's been beaten up in the, for the sake of art. Someday maybe I'll get a lecture about cushions. Um, and Mary, dressed in red, which is love, emotion, things like that, seated on the ground. You're not quite sure. When I said, there was one yesterday, the two standing figures. I said, you were pretty sure they were based on the live model. I'm not quite sure about this one so much, because exactly where is her body at? It's sort of the star shape. People think that's supposed to be over her womb. It might have slipped a bit. Sort of bringing, bringing your attention. But what I was saying yesterday about you know the, the local woolen trade, the business, which brought in so much money to the end. All of the materials here are so beautifully done, the textures, the sheen, the shapes, the shine, all of that sort of stuff, wonderfully done. Again, reading the good book, which, again, the idea is that she's reading the Old Testament, mostly Isaiah, the Old Testament, like Moses, Isaiah, the two great prophets. Isaiah talks about a virgin birth, you know, as a kind of prophecy of, of, of her. So that's what she's supposed to be reading. She's holding the book in a cloth, and that is actually, if you go to Mass, and even if you're not Christian, it's actually, and if you don't even believe in it, if you're a Christian, you still don't believe, it's still actually interesting to go to a Mass, just to see the ritual of, of a Christian service, because unless they've changed now, because they're also modern and different, the priest, when he's holding, you know, the, the Eucharist, when you take the bread, the wine, this is my body, this is my blood, all of that, the, the central you, ritual of Christianity, the, the priest should hold the cup and the, the plate with the bread on it in a cloth because it's so sacred that he can't touch it with his bare hands. Similarly here, because one of the emphasis with Christianity is the word of God. And this is the word of God, so it's a sacred text. And in fact, in Matthew, Mark, I think it's John, the fourth, where actually starts out, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God. So the emphasis on sort of God is the, the teacher in a way. So there she is sitting there, reading the good book, looking quite happy. I mentioned last time about the hair fetish that they all seem to have, this beautiful hair that comes flowing down. 
uh, on the table, see, I mean, technically, if you read the picture realistically, everything on the table should be sliding off onto the floor, but it won't because it's painted. That's all right. Uh, so you're not being naturalistic. And on the table are lovely. Well, actually, actually, why don't we just sit over here? Look up above the fireplace. Well, first of all, even the the windows themselves. That I talked about the almost a, a sideways tribute from the painter, the craftsman, to the carpenter, the craftsman. All this wonderful woodwork with hinges and hardware and everything that's going on here. But look out the window. Clouds. So again, that implies that we're high up. We saw that yesterday. So we're in the holy, the heavenly, chaste uh, space. Uh, the coats of arms, they may have been added a bit later. That, again, refers to families of the people who owned it later on. I talked also a bit about shadows. I mean, there's nothing like a shadow. Again, to point, look at that lovely shadow that comes down from the candlestick. That one's empty. That one's got a candle, but it's not. 99% sure it's not yet lit. Because candles we saw yet last time as well were kind of multitasking symbolically because they could be illumination, divine illumination. But he's, you know this is the Annunciation, so God hasn't shown up yet, so it's not lit. Or it also implies transience because candles. But in fact, you used to be able to find candles that were marked off by hours, so you could tell the time by looking at the candle. Basically, we'll see actually a very good example of that. So all of those sort of bits of realism that are going on here, uh, on the table, I mean that's an unbelievably beautiful vase, sort of a myolica vase with flowers, again with lilies. So he hasn't brought lilies, but they're already there on the table. And again, sort of a cubistic vase, because we look at it from the front, but then we sort of go up a bit, and I think he just wants to show that lovely shape of it that's been pushed around there. Um, now, one of the problems with a lot of this art is you're not sure quite when to stop reading in significance and meaning. Because here what we see is three flowers, or at least we see two flowers and one bud. And any time you see three, you think of the Trinity. That's just how it is. And so is that sort of God the Father, God the Son, again who haven't quite shown up yet, and God the Holy Ghost? Could be, don't know. Uh, lovely, I mean, look at the... the so I'm zooming a bit on this one. Um, remember, this is a book made of animal skin, the, no paper, the, the vellum, the parchment. So you can sort of feel the weight of it. So that would be the kind of um, the new order, if you like, and the, the, the scroll for the Old Testament prophecies, that kind of idea with this beautiful uh, bag. Now, I want all of you to immediately after this lecture to go home, light a candle and blow it out, and paint it and see what you get. I bet it's not as nice as that. But it's the whole thing is sort of pewter candlestick with the wax coming down it and then all of the, you know, the reflect. They, they just, they're obsessed with reflections as well, how one thing affects whatever's next to it. There's a lovely area in behind uh, where, actually, I think I'll go to the whole thing and zoom in a bit, where there's a kind of a wash basin hanging up against the wall. And again, throwing out down lovely shadows, picking up reflections from the window. The towel, which is actually a Jewish prayer shawl, so I'm not quite sure. We'll see a couple of examples, because Jews weren't very popular, let's put it that way, in Europe at this time. But there's quite clear evidence, particularly in the paintings of Jan van Eyck, that he must have been hanging out with rabbis who could tell him things. And the same with Compare here. I mean, that, and I've had lots of Jewish people in my lectures who just immediately say, oh, that's the prayer shawl, so it obviously is. Um, so anyway, all of this, the, the idea of the, I mean, why is the candle blowing out? Because Christ is whooshing into the room at great speed, and, and even, well, maybe even Gabriel's arrival as well, I mean, that might blow candles out. But if you didn't notice him yet, see, here he comes. This amazing little mini Christ. Uh, I can't go into that much further, but um, sort of zooming in, uh, carrying a mini cross, we saw last time again how very often the reference is in the beginning of the end of his life, Alpha Omega. Uh, so here, an obvious, I mean, the one thing you need as you go through life is to carry a cross, I suppose. So here he comes, zooming in, to his womb, sort of, uh, that way. So he'll be there in a second, blowing out candles and lighting candles all over the room. But the point is also is that he's coming through the window. And that's another thing I mentioned last time, was that 
uh, the symbolism of glass that this Swedish mystic, St. Bridget, who compared passing through glass without damaging it in any way to Christ entering into Mary's womb without damaging that. So whenever now you see glass, whether it's a glass bead or a mirror or a window, you think Mary's virginity, that's just how these things work. So, I mean, there's a ton of stuff to go on. I've probably missed quite a few things, I usually do. But, uh, and again, as I, think, I said last time, if you don't look at something like this and see something you never saw before, then something's wrong, because there's just so much little intricate detail. And remember, the whole thing is only about this high, uh, basically. Uh, a couple of other details that don't help that much. Um, rather a goofy expression as well, and that's all right. Uh, so, now the wings, not to dwell too much on this one in particular because there's been so much argument about it, but just, okay, just starting out with hardware and, and woodwork. I mean, look at this, it didn't need to do all that. You can see how the lock works and the keys and things. This total facsimile almost. And it, it's in none of, I said this as well, none of this makes it good art, but it kind of helps. I mean, if you really like to see the real world kind of, a, a, you know, so faithfully represented, in a time-consuming and laborious and loving way. It's rather good. So the, the donor here, I mean, he, when you think of how the three panels are put together, he's not actually looking in and witnessing the Annunciation because the door's in the way, but that's all right. He's sort of there. In the back, I mean, suddenly you've got the idea of the hortus conclusus, the enclosed garden. Uh, but in this case, this is, the door is called the porta clausa, the locked gate, the closed gate. Uh, and in this case, it's open because again, this is the moment of Christ's conception, basically as, as, during the Annunciation. We look right out of the through the gate towards a very contemporary modern street, modern for 1425 or so. Uh, people are a little bit bothered about her, but she's sort of squished in a little bit behind her husband, so they think that maybe he got married later, and that was the figure was added a bit later. Who knows? Uh, again, this gets a bit picky. Now, who's this rather silly looking gentleman here with his hat in his hand? Um, have a clue. But it, people want him to be Isaiah, again, the one who prophesies the coming of the virgin birth, basically. Uh, but he doesn't look very Old Testament prophetish, somehow. Uh, so, who does? I mean, I honestly don't know. Um, but the, the thing is, he's, he's got his hat off, holding his hat in his hand, which is a gesture of reverence on I mean, you take your hand off and you go to church and like that. Uh, another bit of symbolism like that is the bare feet. We'll see examples of that. In, in uh, the Old Testament, again with Moses, he's off in the desert and there's a bush that's on fire because God's inside it and God tells him to take his shoes off because he's standing on holy ground. So when you see people with their shoes off, it implies that sort of divine context. Or, again, the actual context, of, they might be having sex. So it's either holy or sexy. Uh, and if you know, there's a famous fragonard that some of you may know of a lady on a swim, and she's actually kicking her shoes yeah. through the air. Yeah. And, that, and that's unbelievable. I mean, it's good enough to have your shoes off, but in mid-air, that's even better. <laughs> so again, context is everything, location, location. Just can I... Yeah. Why are you talking about their feet right now? Because it's a similar element of kind of like he's got his hat off that's one way of showing reverence the oh, other okay. way is to take your shoes off 